Uh, welcome back. Uh, hopefully everyone had a good coffee break. There are lots of seats if people want to come up and, and fill in. Um, we've spent a lot of today talking about the future. And so I get to talk about the past uh, with these uh, two fine speakers. Um, first, immediately to my left, is Adam Fisher. Adam uh, grew up in Silicon Valley programming computers, uh, has written for publications including Wired, the MIT Technology Review, the New York Times Sunday Magazine, and most recently wrote a book called Valley of Genius. And we have a bunch of copies of the book uh, for attendees. And for a little bit after this, if you grab a book, then Adam has promised uh, to sign them. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great read. So uh, I encourage you to, to read it. And then Richard Tedlow. Uh, Richard uh, was the class of 1949 professor of business administration emeritus at the Harvard Business School. Uh, he was a member of the faculty from 1979 to 2010. Uh, and it was actually one of my professors when I was at, at business school. And am, and am uh, uh, very happy that we've stayed in touch over the years. He wrote uh, the book. Um, I, he, he would say a biography of, of Andy Grove. I would say the biography of Andy Grove called uh, Giants of Enterprise and Andy Grove. Uh, they were selected by Bu Bloomberg Business Week among the top 10 business books in their respective years. And um, Barack Obama actually recommended the Andy Grove book uh, as, as one of the books he would recommend people read. And um, he also uh, more recently uh, was one of the people who helped build Apple University, which is one of the internal organizations at Apple University. And it was uh, on the faculty uh, there until, until fairly recently. So I'm really honored to have you both on stage. We're, we're sitting right now in almost, almost hallowed ground for Silicon Valley and technology. We're in, we're in an area known as South Park. And, and I thought, Adam, you could tell us a little bit about like what, what have been some of the companies that have been born and grown up and some of the organizations and, and some of the stories that have happened within a couple blocks of where we are sitting right now? Well, little known fact, South Park wasn't always called South Park. It used to be known as Heroin Park. Um, back. That was before it was $150 per square foot at the real estate uh, listings that are there now. Exactly, exactly. You, you know, it was... Yeah, it was a place where you'd run into homeless people and junkies. Um, but it, and around it, you know, there wasn't so much companies, and I'm talking early 90s now, but uh, kind of artists. Um, the, big, the first big rave scene in San Francisco, which was a direct import from London, uh, had a, like a commune. That was on South Park, and um, you so know. So these are all just like Cloudflare, basically. Yeah, just <laughs> like just like Cloudflare, yeah. yeah, without the Harvard connection. That's but. right. Yes. Um, you know, uh, there was a guy named Eve Bahar who was like, you know, an artist who started a business that, uh, you know, on the park. There were a bunch of little magazines, the kind of San Francisco magazine scene. Um, uh, was headquartered off South Park. Um, there was a magazine called Future Sex. There was a magazine called Mondo 2000. Um, and there was a magazine called Cups, which was a, a precursor to what we now know as McSweeney's. And there was a magazine called Wired. Um, those are probably the most notable businesses. And they were there because it was cheap. Um, and they were actually there because of technology. The, the reason you could even have kind of a slick magazine uh, culture in San Francisco is because of the Macintosh and desktop publishing. You know, suddenly you could make these kind of underground magazines look like magazines coming out of New York. Hmm. Um, and that's what was here. Yeah, this building was actually the, at one point, the home of Monster Cable, which then <laughs> turned into Beats Audio. Uh, over time, and we, if you go down to the electrical panels downstairs, you can still see the labeling for that. So both of you have had, you know, a really an opportunity to interview a lot of the kind of great business leaders at through through the history of, of Silicon Valley. And I wondered if 
there were, if there was any common thread or common theme that you've seen across, across those, and, and Richard, I, I start with you. Of, is there, what, what have you seen that's been common among many of the, the leaders that you've gotten a chance to get to know over the years? Um, I think um, the, uh, the, 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 there are two things, I guess. Uh, uh, one is, uh, in Tim Cook's words, uh, he has rhinoceros skin. And that's really required, I think. Um, uh, and the second is that they have a ability, they have an ability to think different. Uh, and, and, and it's those two things that the, the people who made history in Silicon Valley, to me, share. Uh, and I find quite impressive. Yeah. There, Adam, themes that have, I mean, you, it, it, when, when, you, when you read Adam's book, it's, it's really fascinating because it's it's, it almost reads like a screenplay because it's a series of statements from all of the different people who were involved that have been put together to form a narrative. But was, in, in the process of interviewing all those people, were there, were there things that really just stood out as, as themes that, that made sense through that time? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I'd second what Richard says for sure. Um, but the, the big surprise for me when I went and collected all these origin stories from all the companies you, you've heard of, and some probably you might not have but should have heard of, um, were that in the, various early, the earliest days, you know, people knew they were creating history, and they were having an enormous amount of fun. There was just an incredible spirit of kind of creativity um, that was going on. Uh, that, and, and that's what caused people to kind of end up working all night. Not because of this kind of this lash of like, I'm going to just work harder. Um, and and uh, it, it's almost a, a leading indicator. It, if everybody says, oh my god, we were having so much fun, it was so great because we were creating something new every day. Um, well, then that's, that augured really well for the future um, of these companies. So, what was, is it, were, I mean, was that, some of your book is, I mean, your, your whole book is, is telling the stories of, of largely the people that won. Um, although you tell uh, the stories like General Magic, General which, Magic, yeah. which, which would, would, I mean, there's an incredible cast of characters yeah. that went through there and, and didn't, didn't turn in any, anything. Did, did, you, did you see any, did you, you see a difference between, or did you talk to many of the people who, who didn't do, didn't win, or some of the yeah. 100,000 people who left, you know, San Francisco in, in 2000 when the bubble burst? Yeah, in 2001? I mean, the way I see the kind of modern uh, history of Silicon Valley is basically, you know, Atari early 70s to uh, say 84 when the Macintosh came out. And then <clears throat> you've got the kind of internet 95 on, right? And there's this, so there's essentially three main acts, this early Atari Apple act, this later internet act, and then this middle act, 84 to 95. So uh, Macintosh launched to Netscape IPO, where essentially everything that Silicon Valley tried to do failed, hmm. okay? And that's a third of the book. And that's the General Magic chapter, that's the well, that's uh, VPL, which invented virtual reality, I can go on. But there is a lot of failure. Um, um, uh, and yeah, they were having fun too, I, I admit it. But um, uh, uh, but it, as it turned out, there, you know, General Magic maybe was a failure as, as a company, but they invented the iPhone, uh, you know, to a first approximation. Is it, I mean, you get, it's, it, it's almost like, um, I don't know if you watched the, the TV show Halt and Catch Fire, but yeah. it's the same people go from inventing Compact to AOL to video games. It, but you almost get the same feeling yeah. from the book where, Eve Bahar weaves his way through, yeah. you know, the, the story along the way, and, and you've got characters that feel like they kind of continue to repeat through that. How much of, of the story of modern Silicon Valley is being really written by, 
by those those no, people. No, the same. It's like it's like two dozen people made Silicon Valley. It, to you know, in a way, um, and that's because you know companies like just to to mention one, General Magic. Yeah, it was a failure because a bunch of VCs lost their money. But so what? It wasn't a failure to... to all the VCs all, in the audience just sort of <laughs> sorry, back in the chair. Sorry, sorry. Uh, but it wasn't a failure. The people who are really creating the technology and moving on and, and getting incredible experience, which they then almost literally brought to uh, you know, Apple um, later. And, and, and so you see this um, kind of... The vector is a human vector that goes through all these companies. The names of the companies change, but the ideas are associated with people, and they and they at, and at some point, you know, the technology and the market is right. You get product market fit, and you know, you get you get you get another billionaire. So, so Richard, the you know, Silicon Valley is kind of this funny. You're talking about genius of Silicon Valley. There's not much silicon being made in, in Silicon Valley anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, you've you've spent a bunch of time studying and, and really getting to know, you know, Andy Grove and the team at Intel. Can you t talk a little bit about back the history of when Silicon Valley was actually making making silicon? Well, it certainly was uh, when he was there. And um, uh, when I was writing that book, uh, um, among the people that I met was Arthur Rock, which is a name that may be familiar to some of you. And um, we had dinner at the, a place called the Lion and Compass, which I don't know if any of you know that place. And um, I remember when the dinner was uh, organized, uh, there were four of us there. Uh, I was instructed by the person who invited me to meet Arthur to pick up the check. Um, now, this is strictly confidential, but Arthur is wealthier than I am. Uh, he and basically invented venture capital. Yeah, and he was a seed investor in Intel and in God only knows how many other companies. And, and Apple, he was on the board of Apple forever and this and that and the other. And um, uh, it, was, it was at that dinner that he said to me that Intel needed Noyce, Moore, and Grove, and it needed them in that order. And that helped me understand why he was so much wealthier than I am. Uh, that's true. I mean, Noyce was this um, magic man. I mean, he was, he was uh, talk about the beginnings of Silicon Valley. I mean, uh, Shockley came out to found Shockley Semiconductor after being the co-inventor of the transistor at, AT and at Bell Labs because he wanted to be near his mother and because the weather was better out here. Um, and, and, and eight people went to work for Shockley Semiconductor and uh, Arthur Rock knew all these people and he knew Shockley and Shockley was, you know, impossible. And so they all decamped from Shockley Semiconductor to Fairchild Semiconductor. Fairchild Semiconductor, um, and they were called by, uh, they were labeled immortally by Shockley the traitorous eight. And so these traitorous eight went to Fairchild Semiconductor Fairchild Semiconductor, founded by Sherman Fairchild, whose father was the first CEO of IBM in 1911. Um, I'm an historian. I, I do the past. You do the future. Um, okay. Um, uh, Noyce was not chosen to become the CEO of that, so he decided to leave that firm. And in June of 1968, he, he went to Gordon Moore of Moore's Law, and he said, I have an idea for a company. And uh, Andy Grove was Intel employee number three. So Noyce was the co-inventor of the integrated circuit, uh, you know, as smart as anybody. Moore is the Moore of Moore's law, still alive, made more money from Intel than anybody else. And Andy Grove uh, is, in many ways, a very unlikely character. I mean, he, he uh, uh, spent the first 20 years of his life in Hungary, served in the Hungarian army, uh, was uh, spent the first 10 years of his life running from the Nazis and the next 10 years of his life running from the communists. And in 1956, there was a revolt in Hungary. The border between Hungary and Austria was open for a brief time. He literally crawled into Austria, managed to get to New York, uh, um, got a, uh, a degree at the City College of New York, where the engineering school is now, the Andy Grove Engineering School. Um, then came out here to Berkeley, got a PhD in chemical engineering, 
and he had two choices. He could go to Bell Labs or to this, uh, to work at, at first at Fairchild with, um, with Gordon Moore. And he was so enchanted that Moore understood his thesis that he said, you're my guy. And one of the fascinating things about Grove was he thought he was going to a startup. I mean, he was Intel employee number three. Uh, actually, he was Intel employee number four. He should have been Intel employee number three, but a guy named Les Vedez turned out to be Intel employee number three. Andy has described Les as um, a typical Hungarian. He gets into a revolving door behind you and comes out ahead of you. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it was Andy who helped engineer this very important change, which is much studied in business schools, from a focus on dynamic random access memory to a commitment to the microprocessor. And there's one important moment in that story uh, in which uh, Andy and Gordon, they're depressed. These are, and this is the difference between business strategy and brain weight. These guys are both smart. But thinking about business and, and strategy is, can be different from just brain weight. And at one point, Andy says to Gordon, um, if the board fired us and uh, um, brought in a new CEO, what do you think he would do? The assumption was it was going to be a he. This was in 1985. This discussion took place. And uh, um, Moore answered without hesitation, he would get us out of memories. And then Grove said, why don't you and I walk out the door, come back in, and do it ourselves? And that thought experiment was a way of erasing history. Intel went public on the 1103 memory chip. They were memory. When that business started, they had 100% market share. And when they were being overwhelmed by the Japanese, they couldn't believe it. Um, and, and they finally got out of the business when they had 3% market share. And then they concentrated. Andy became the CEO of the company in 1987. They concentrated on the microprocessor. And the rest is Wintel. The rest is history, so to speak. So, so wh and why did you need them in that order then? Like that, that you sort of talked about the, the value that, that Grove brought in there. But why did you need Noyce then more than, than? Noyce was the magnet. Noyce was the man who was already well known. Noyce knew Kleiner. Noyce knew uh, John Ernie. Jo Noyce knew the trader aid. He was one of them. Uh, Moore is perhaps the greatest technologist that the United States produced in the 20th century. So you needed him then because the 1103, to, I'm not an engineer, but I've spoken to my share of them, everybody <laughs> said was just a miserable device to try to make work. So you needed somebody with a large brain to go out to customers and show them how. Andy was, was a born marketer. And, and it was under Andy that Intel Inside was born. And that, that I'm, as I say, I'm an historian, is extraordinarily rare that a component supplier becomes a channel commander. And they were only able to do that because they branded the, the chip Intel Inside. Back in the day, you're young. You're, you, for example. I mean, you're young. And so are you. I used to be young. Now, now I'm old. That's, that's, that's how this works. Um, but back when I was young, like you, people would go into places like CompUSA, which they can't go into now because they aren't around, and they wouldn't ask for a Compaq or a Dell or an Osborne. They'd ask for a 386 machine. In other words, the microprocessor, the component, came to define the product. And that's extremely rare, and that was Andy. Hmm. So that's Noyce Moore and Grove. So, so you both have written a ton about the history of Silicon Valley. Um, we're living through an interesting time now. We've had a bunch of panels this morning talking about how the, the worm has turned to some extent, to a large mm -hmm. extent on this, where you know, technology used to be the, the panacea and, and the thing that was going to solve the world's problems, and now we see increasing um, uh, regulation and, and, and attention, negative attention on that. Are there, are there times in, in the past and what you've studied before that, that, that are instructive to what, what we're doing now? Or, or maybe, what's the advice, you know, uh, 
Richard, you, you, you had Sheryl Sandberg as a, as a student at I some did, point. Yeah. What would be the advice that you'd give Facebook um, right now? Um, uh, once again, there's no brain weight issue there. I mean, Sheryl Sandberg was a Baker Scholar, as I believe you were as well. Uh, uh, a recovering lawyer, too. Oh, I try I and hide a lot of things. But. <laughs> um, uh, um, I, I think I just saw an article just before coming on stage, and I didn't get a chance to read it, so maybe one, one of you can help me out. But I, I understand that Facebook still hasn't discovered the cause of the latest data breach. And advice that I would give her, she wouldn't need, but it's get control of your product because it seems to be out of their hands right at the moment. And uh, as we've just learned uh, with the Supreme Court hearings, uh, what, what teenagers and young people do is, is, isn't going to disappear. It's going to matter a lot in their future lives. And people need, in other words, there's a heavy ethical component, and especially with the coming of artificial intelligence, there's going to be a heavy ethical component to, to technological advances, and people have to, take, they have to take ownership of that. So that's the advice that I would give. Yeah. See a political philosopher in a hurry. Adam, any advice? Oh, well, you know, I'm a historian, so I have to, have to take the long view, have to step back. And what I see now is definitely that, you know, the worm has turned. But when I started writing my book, four years ago, five years ago, Silicon Valley kind of could do no wrong. You know, it kind of pulled us out of 2008 depression. Um, and, uh, you know, we were great. Now, now I look at kind of the, you know, the mainstream media, the discourse, and it's kind of everybody is bad in Silicon Valley. And what I, what I see is, that this is just another in a long series of boom and bust cycles, okay? So, um, you know, I, I don't know what happened during the Silicon era, but, you know, when Atari was the, was kind of Silicon Valley in the 70s, it was making more money than all of the Hollywood studios combined, and 18 months later, completely collapsed. That was... Oh. Look at Silicon Graphics. Yeah. I mean, Silicon Graphics collapse. So, so that was 77. Actually, there was another collapse in 84. You know, there was this long dead period um, that we talked about before the internet was kind of opened up. There was a huge collapse in 2000, 2001. The, the That's why I'm a recovering lawyer and not a securities <laughs> lawyer, by the way. Ex exactly. And, and, and now what I see is another big collapse. Um, and companies like Facebook and Google, you know, are, are probably too dug in to actually collapse in the way that Pets.com collapsed, for example. But there is this, you know, rhyme, you know, it's, it's history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. And we have this reputational collapse. And what I see and what we've learned from these prior collapses is that it really pushes out a lot of the people who are here for the wrong reasons. The kind of people who, you know, want to get rich quick. The MBA are, students. The Harvard <laughs> Law, the yeah. Harvard MBA yeah. Yeah. students, yeah, yeah. you know. Sorry. There's no BS like HBS. I yes, to say exactly. It, <laughs> but, you know, and, and you get back to the, the kind of more high-minded technologists, and, and they get back to their, like, crazy ideas that really don't need venture money and don't need a business plan, but need just some time in a basement um, coding and, you know, creating stuff. So, you know, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Twitter, you know? I'm talking about, well, Facebook. I'm talking about Napster, which I know is a failure, but we've got Spotify now. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to let can, people. Can I just, yeah. for a split second, hitchhike on on, sure. yeah. on, on what Adam's been saying, because you, you've mentioned failure more than once, and I think uh, I think there's one thing that needs to be uh, emphasized is that sometimes failure happens in Silicon Valley because people don't know what they have. The classic example is Xerox Park. Yeah. But another very interesting example is, is Alta Vista, and I wonder if I can ask you, could you tell the Alta Vista story? Uh... Well, I mean, Alta, in, 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 
1998, AltaVista was the, the leading search engine uh, that was built by, everyone forgets, but Digital Equipment Corporation. Uh, and they built it, there was, it was an advertising platform, but there was only one ad on all of AltaVista, and it was buy a deck mainframe. So they built a search engine, the leading technologically advanced search engine in the world, in order to sell mainframes, because what you needed at the time to build a great search engine was a big mainframe, and then there were two kids getting their PhD down at Stanford who didn't have the money to buy a mainframe, but thought, can we write some clever software to hook a bunch of cheap computers together to build something that was more powerful, and that obviously became, became Google. But yeah. it's, it is amazing, and you see this a lot through, through, through your book, where you, the, the, the future is out there already, it just hasn't completely materialized. I'm gonna let people ask questions in a second, but I had one, one more question maybe for, for both of you. Where, where would you, I mean, if you'd been sitting in General Magic, you'd have met all the people that went on to build the iPhone, right? Where would you go sit today, and where would you be looking for those people and those ideas to build whatever it is that comes next? Um, what you're asking me, I, I sit in Cupertino. Um, they, you know, uh, the, the, the company's got a lot of imagination. There are a lot of people working at that company. Now, I've spent eight years there, but I'm not employed there anymore, and I'm not in their public relations department. But I was simply enormously impressed by um, not just the vice presidents, many of whom you may have heard of, but it struck me that there were about as many vice presidents at Apple as there were tenured professors at the Harvard Business School. And it also struck me that if you put their names on a large sheet of paper and threw a dart, you were much more likely to hit somebody really smart on the Apple VP list than on the HBS professor list. That's because at the Harvard Business School, there's something called tenure, which means that you get to stay there no matter how dumb you grow as you age. Uh, at Apple, uh, you, you either achieve results or you're not gonna keep working there. You put that together with the fact that inside the organization, I mean, the people who built the camera here are the best people, the best camera people in the phone world on earth. And the way they work together, the fact that this company is, is vertically integrated from silicon to retail, all these different functions having different schedules and the fact that they can still make it work, um, I just think, and that, and that they have resources. I just, I would sit in Cupertino. They've, they've become the IBM that they once sought to disrupt. Precisely, and they don't want to, and they don't want to wind up, you know, in the same place. Yeah. Actually, but go ahead. Adam, anywhere you'd look for innovation? Yeah, I, I'd actually give the exact opposite advice, <laughs> with the caveat that I have never been a Harvard Business School uh, professor. Um, I would, yeah, I would stay away from Apple, Facebook, Google, or or any any established corporation, and I'd go to kind of the the underground. What you know, it's like, what do the engineers coming out of Stanford think are cool, or is the coolest project possible? And it would be. Oh, a cryptocurrency. It would be a flying car. It would be, you know, a rocket company. I, you know, the, the things that really end up succeeding are the things that, you know, turn the young engineers on. Uh, almost by definition. Uh, it, it's, my favorite example is, uh, of this is, um, 3D printers. Literally, no one needs a 3D printer, okay? <laughs> but it's just so cool, okay? It's just so cool. And, you know, they kind of figured out how to do it, and this, literally, they, <laughs> literally, they were, the first 3D printer was using, like, a bed, bed, bed of cat litter and glue to make things, and it was refined. And then, you know, five years later, it's, it's under everybody's Christmas tree, you know, or a drone, something like that. Um, you know, I, I really think it's about the passions of, of young technical people that really define what happens. Um, and then, yeah, the market has to find an application for a drone or a 3D printer, but they will sooner or later. There you go. Some questions. 
Uh, here. Hold, hold on, wait for a microphone. As the pace of uh, technology and the business models that are being built on it begin to accelerate, like what, what are your thoughts on how uh, like companies and people that are just playing with new technologies can weave uh, ethics, uh, compassion, and mindfulness, like not only into the technologies, but the business processes and the models and the way they connect people? Shall I, shall you want me to start? I'll be real quick. I think the companies that don't um, are going to be punished for not doing so. Um, the, the, the biggest difference between today, when we have our first trillion dollar company, and 1901, when we had our first billion dollar company, which was US Steel, uh, I mean, is that today, companies, and even books, we were discussing this briefly before coming on, are platforms. They're two-sided markets. A platform is something upon which someone builds. And if you say, as the, as the person who owns that platform, what happens on it is not my business, um, uh, people are going to wind up hating you. And that's not good. I mean, when the whole world hates you, it's bad. And uh, I mean, you took the Daily Stormer off Cloudflare. You made a decision. Uh, um, you were a platform. There was, you could make a freedom of speech argument that that wasn't a good idea. Uh, I'm glad you did it. You, you, it probably so, wasn't a good idea, but that's a whole other story. Well, um, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I, we, I, made, we certainly made a point. We, we illustrated why it was dangerous for us to, to do something like that, which I think was part of what we were trying to, to demonstrate at the time. But it was, uh, it, we needed to have that conversation. So, okay. Yeah. Well, put it this way, the people who work in these companies, uh, big or small, uh, are working 24-hour days, seven days a week, and uh, sometimes they think they don't have time for ethics, you know, and the fact is they don't have time to skip it. Um, because if you skip it, you pay a price. I mean, uh, Tim Cook was recently asked, some of you may have seen this, um, what would you do in Mark Zuckerberg's position? Does anybody happen to know what his response was? I would never be in his position. That's right. Uh, so, um, you know. For those on the live stream, Michelle yelled out, I would never be in his position. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, you can either agree with Cook or not, but to have, you know, one CEO of a company with, which is worth a trillion dollars talking about another CEO of a company which is worth a half a trillion or, you know, a lot of money, that publicly is not that common around here. Um, but that's because he believes that, that privacy is a fundamental human right. And by the way, long term, that may redound to Apple's, uh, not, not to their benefit. Who knows? I mean, Apple and Google have very different ideas about privacy. And that, that means that, that running their internet service businesses are very different. So, but I should shut up and... Well, uh, we, we're, we're out of time. Uh, I really appreciate you guys uh, coming and sharing this. And Adam's going to stick around for a little bit to sign some books. And so thank you so much and, and encourage you to read both of their books. Thank you. Thank you.